Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. The word of today, today's key word, is delusional. And here's why I say that, because the sermon itself is about the Battle of Armageddon. And you must understand the premise of the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon is a literal war against God himself. After seven years of the tribulation period, the world has been stirred up to such a point where they believe the only way for their survival to continue is to fight against the creator who created them. The battle of Armageddon or the climax of the tribulation period, that which happens in the valley of Jezreel, what you've heard about for for your entire life, this battle is a battle and a war against God himself. So the word of today is delusional. Say it with me. Delusional. How delusional do you have to be to think you can fight against God and when? I've never been an athlete. Not really. I had a Nintendo. <laughs> and I played double dribble. Tecmo Super Bowl. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Let me see my 80s babies. There we go. But I was never much of an athlete. And whenever I um, started dating Heather, found out she was an athlete. I mean, extreme. She liked all sorts of sports, played the sports, watched the sports, did the sports. I say things like, did the sports. (laughs) Not much of an athlete. And she said, you know, we talked about all sorts of stuff. She said, did you ever think about trying out for one of your teams, you know, in school? I said, no. She said, well, now we're in college. Now, in our college, we had a collegiate system where you could join teams that your fraternity had or your sorority had, or you could play intercollegiately. So I, I thought, man, you know, it'd be awesome. I'm going to join the softball team, and I'm going to show her how awesome I could be. <laughs> how many of you have never really, you're not much of an athlete, and then you tried to join a team? How many have ever done this? So I begin, I'm a, the problem with me is that I'm an extreme optimist. And I begin to think to myself how amazing this is all going to turn out. I remember thinking, okay, tryouts are going to be a week or so from now. And I begin just imagining what it's going to be like playing baseball. I remember, I remember thinking all the, the field goals that I'm going to be able to score. And I remember thinking, you know, all the three-pointers I'm going to be able to shoot. It's going to be an amazing opportunity on the baseball, on the baseball court. And I'm, it's, it was going to be awesome. I was going to be great. And I began to dream about like, like what it was. I watched The Sandlot growing up. How many of you watched Sandlot? I remember thinking, man, I'm going to be like Benny Rodriguez, man. I'm going to be running the bases. I'm going to win. I'm going to, I'm going to hit the, the, the game-winning uh, uh, touchdown or whatever it is. And, and what's going to happen is at the end of the game, they're going to lift me up on their shoulders, kind of like this. They're going to lift me up. This was my dream, you know? <laughs> this is the problem with an optimist. I really genuinely thought, man, I'm going to really learn this game. I know I can learn what I'm going to learn. I'm going to just kill it. This is my picture of what I thought life was going to be like. This was the reality. This is uh, the reality of what life actually turned out. That's me. (laughs) That's me. I I just made the team. I'm sitting on the bench. (laughs) I had two responsibilities. I got the water for everyone and I kept the bench warm is what I did. I made the team, though. Give me a round of applause. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Heather used to say, I'm going to come out to your games. And I would say, oh, oh, good. That'd be great. He said, what made you think that you could do what you cannot do? Here's what made me think. It's because I was delusional. Delusional? Have you ever been there in any aspect of your life? Maybe in a relationship, you were delusional about where it was headed. Maybe in a career choice, delusional about what was expected. Listen, have you ever been delusional? No one, no one has ever reached the height of delusion like Satan himself. See, Satan's story begins where he's an angel in heaven. And the Bible tells us as an archangel, he would look down upon the throne of God himself. 
and he began to dream like I dreamt. But his dream was not of athletic heroism. His dream was to become God himself. And so much was his delusion that he began to dream in his heart. What would it be like for me to sit on the throne of God? What would it be like for me to fight against God himself and take over heaven? Imagine the audacity of an angel thinking he could overrun and overcome his creator. But he did. His name was not Satan at the time, it was Lucifer. And Lucifer was so delusional, he believed he could win against God. And so convincing in his arguments that he convinced a third of the angels to rebel against God. And leave heaven for hell. That's delusional. Now we arrive at the end of the tribulation period and the Bible says at the end of chapter 16 of Revelation that the devil sends out three lying spirits to the kings of the world. And these lying spirits like Lucifer himself to the angels begins to convince the leaders of the world to bring their armies to a valley called Jezreel, a valley outside of a small area called Megiddo. And they are there to fight, not against the Jews, not against the Christians, not against God's people, but to fight against God himself. For we've read the prophecies and we see the prophecies and Jesus said he's coming back after this seven years of tribulation. He's coming in the sky and then Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 that the sign of the son of man is in heaven perhaps they even can see as Jesus is heading back to heaven and the armies of the world gather to fight against this coming king and the Bible says when they see him coming they mourn and they think to themselves this is not going to go well and no it doesn't why because who are they to think they could fight against God himself We see the battle of Armageddon play out. Today's sermon will be one of those sermons, friend, that you'll walk out sobered, realizing who we are as humans and who He is as Creator. And we begin today with the return of Jesus. Today's first point, if you're following along and taking notes in preparation for small group, the return of Jesus Christ. How many of you are thankful that Jesus Christ came the first time? Can I get an amen? amen. How many of you believe Jesus is coming back? Say amen. amen. You see, Jesus, the night before he was crucified, betrayed, crucified, the Bible tells us that Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I'm going away, but if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there, you may be also. Jesus said over and over again, they're taking my life and I'm going away, but I will come again. I know people have said for years, whoa, 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 it's been thousands of years, 2,000 be exact, since your Savior has left and left you abandoned in this world. You still think he's coming? The answer is, believe of Christ have always believed he's coming back. I know it's been a while, but look, when I trust the one I trust, it doesn't matter how he delays. I believe that he's coming again. Can I get an amen? amen. The Bible says Jesus will come again and describes this coming in the book of Revelation chapter 19 in the most glorious and in the most terrible words. The second coming of Jesus. Did you know that there is a very specific newspaper type that are used by newspaper men specifically and only for the world's biggest events, huge events that take place? A specific type that they cannot use on the newspaper all year long except for major world-changing events. Do you know what the type is called? It's called second coming type. Oh, this is true. In fact, you can look it up and Google it. Here's a few examples of this second coming type. Hitler dead in chancellery, Nazis say, and go on and on. What is this? This is literally the New York Times using a type they only use for special occasions. It's called second coming type. Here's another. This is Kennedy is killed by sniper as he rides in car in Dallas. Here's another. Bin Laden killed by U.S. forces in Pakistan. Obama says, declaring justice has been done. Now look, 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 look. Why does the New York Times 
have a specific type called second coming type that they only use for the biggest world events. Here's why. Because why don't they call it big event type? Why don't they call it huge thing just happened type? Why don't they call it cataclysmic world changing event type? Here's why. Because there's no bigger event than the second coming of Christ. And even the New York Times knows it. When Jesus Christ comes back, friend, though the world doubts its truth, suddenly the world will see it and know. Revelation 19 describes at the very end of the seven-year tribulation period what takes place. Chapter 19, look at what it says in verse number 11. It says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His, on his head were many crowns and his name was written that no man knew except himself. This is describing Jesus Christ himself coming back the second time. Notice how different Jesus looks from the time he was last on earth. Because Jesus Christ came the first time as a meek and mild baby in a manger. Poor and innocent. He lived a life of a carpenter, a small rabbi who walked around telling people of the Father, doing miracles and healing those. That was what Jesus Christ came as the first time. They took him and beat him even though he had all power under his authority and could have stopped his crucifixion at any time. He allowed himself to die upon the cross to pay for our sins. He came the first time as a sacrificial lamb to die for the sins of mankind. He is coming the second time not in that way. He comes back the second time as a conquering king who's ready to fight against the nations who are wanting to fight against him, to deliver the people of God who have been persecuted these now seven years. The Bible says in verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Can you picture there this man on this white stallion and his long flowing white vestures and the ends and the tips of his robe are drenched with crimson blood. Where did he get this blood as he arrives in the city of Israel? We're going to see where he gets this blood in the second point. And the Bible goes on and it says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. See, Jesus is not alone when we see him coming in the clouds. There's an army with him. You say, who are those, white, uh, those, those people in white robes? Are they angels? No, they're not. It's described who those people are when the Bible says that we, we Christians who have been raptured, we will be in heaven. And we're going to talk about this next week. We have gone through what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And during the judgment seat of Christ, before the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb, the Bible says that the marriage supper of the Lamb, we have been given new robes, white robes, linen robes, and we enter in in these garments that symbolize the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we celebrate this beautiful marriage supper. Now we are clothed in white. Where do we go from here? We mount up and we follow Jesus to the earth. And look what the Bible says. It goes on and says, verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. You say, if we're the army with Jesus, are we going to fight against these people? The answer is, when you're with Jesus, you don't have to do the fighting. <laughs> By the way, how many of you are thankful to have Jesus on your side? Can I get an amen? This is why God said, don't take vengeance. What are you doing? Why are you trying to be vengeful with people? I am God. Vengeance is mine. I'll take care of it. So here we are, you say, well, if we don't do the fighting, who does the fighting? The Bible says that a sharp sword goes out of the mouth of Jesus. I believe this is symbolic. It means that his very word is the sword of God. That the moment he speaks, the armies of Armageddon are being destroyed. It's out of his very mouth. It's not like Jesus is pulling a sword out and chopping people. All he has to do, hey, look, all Jesus had to do to create the world was say, let there be light. And there was light. Now all Jesus has to do is say, let you die and you're dead. 
and on his thigh a name written, the Bible says, King of kings and Lord of lords, just so people know who he is. Jesus has it right there on his robe. King of kings, Lord of lords. And just in case in the midst of battle, his garment goes across, suddenly you see his thigh, he put it there too. King of kings, Lord of lords. He ain't kidding around. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Too often we sit back and we think to ourselves, well, as Christians, we're just meek and mild and we need to follow the example of Christ. Yes, this is true, but when Christ comes back, he comes with power and glory and authority to take back that which is his. Look at what it says in verse 17, amazingly. It says, then I saw, this is John speaking, this is why he's speaking in the personal pronoun, then I saw the angel standing in the sun, crying with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourself together to the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and those that sit on them, and the flesh of all people, both free and slave, both small and great. John is standing there, and all of a sudden he hears something, he looks to the sky, and there in the sun, He's blinded by it for a moment, but there's an angel flying between him and the sun and the angel cries out and he's speaking to the birds. He says, birds of the world, come. You're about to have the biggest feast of human flesh there ever was. Imagine what that would look like as the birds of the world start flying into the valley and begin to circle that giant location. Kings and captains, poor people and rich people, free people and slaves, all of them gathered with one purpose in solidarity as they hold their hands together and look up to God and say, you can't tell us what to do anymore. Jesus Christ comes back and says of a truth, you will be eaten by these birds. And I saw the beast. Whatever happened to the Antichrist? Oh, he's leading this battle. How delusional do you have to be to think you can defeat God himself? Please understand something about Satan. Please understand something. He is not stupid. He is not weak. But he is delusional. He always has thought and genuinely still thinks, I got a chance. I got a chance. I think, I mean, it's a small chance, but I think I could take over. Are you delusional? The answer is yes. And he's so good with his convincing words that he convinces the armies of the world that they can fight against this God that's coming after them. They gathered to make war against him. How prideful is the heart of Satan? How prideful the heart of man? Made out of dust, we come from dirt and clay. We're nothing. We live a few years, and if we happen to get hit hard by something, we die. But we think we're going to fight against God himself. Oh, mankind, how delusional we can be. The beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gather together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Look at the next verse. It says, and the beast was captured. Well, of course he was. Of course the anti... How many of you believe the Antichrist is going to lose? Say amen. All right, yeah. A bunch of Christians. If you ask that question during the tribulation period, at this point, most of them think, I think we got a chance. Then the beast, that is the Antichrist, was captured with him, the false prophet who worked signs. If you were here two weeks ago, you know who this is. By which he deceived those that received the mark of the beast and those that worshipped him. And look what the Bible says he does with these two. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest that were killed with the sword which proceeded out of the mouth of him who was sitting on the, th- on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. There it is, that's the end. That is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are we surprised? Are we surprised by this? Let me ask you this. Are you surprised that Jesus wins, yes or no? But are you surprised that mankind fights against Jesus, yes or no? I'm not. 
One of the things we've learned about God is he'll never be defeated. One of the things we learned about man is that we're delusional. Does it surprise you that in the end of the story, the daughters of Eve and the sons of Adam rise up to fight against the God who created them? Does it surprise us? No. Here's why. Here's one of the basic tenets of Christianity that you cannot miss. God is good. Man is bad. And we only understand forgiveness and our potential when we repent of our sin and follow him as Savior. Humanism, today's religion in our society, teaches us that we are good and God is bad. That is wrong, Christian. Can I get an amen? amen. God is good. Humans sin against God. Are we surprised that we fight against him here? Of course we're not surprised because mankind has so often been delusional. Before we move on, let me ask this question. You say, who would fight against God? Who? Who? Oh, friend, before we point our fingers at these someday to come people who fight against God, how often do we sit in our church and sit in our homes and sit in our cars and sit in our hearts and we fight them? Amen. Amen. We fight against him. And he only wants what's best for you. We question him. We fight against him. We curse his name. We blaspheme him. Oh, friend, who are we to do this? First, we see the return of Jesus. Now, today, I want us to move to the second aspect of the second coming, and that is we see the three battles of the Battle of Armageddon itself. Did you know that the Battle of Armageddon is not just one campaign? There really are three campaigns that are happening at the same time if you study all of the prophets together. Now, I'm not going to belabor this point because you'll be able to discuss this maybe in small group this week a little further, but there are multiple campaigns. It's not just in one location. There are really three locations, more than that, but only three we have time to talk about today. The first one takes place in what we call Edom. Uh, Edom would be modern day, uh, uh, ancient Moab or Edom or what we would refer to as uh, modern day Jordan, part of the Battle of Armageddon. Some of you are saying, no, 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 I know where the Valley of Jezreel is and the Valley of Armageddon. I'll get there. But according to the scripture, I believe that what we see according to Isaiah chapter 63, the very first thing that takes place, chronologically speaking, in the Battle of Armageddon is a rescue of Israel in the land of Edom. If you're interested, by the way, in this, you should be coming on Sunday nights. I do a Bible study where I go through the minor prophets. Tonight, I'm in the book of Amos. We dig deeper into this concept. Isaiah chapter 63 says this, who is he who comes from Edom with his dyed garments from Basra, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? By the way, who does that sound like? Glorious in his peril, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Later, it says he's got blood on his garments. Who do you think that sounds like? Yes, that sounds like what we just read, right? But this is written by Isaiah, somebody who came about 700 years before the guy who wrote the book of Revelation. So this prophet cries out, he says, who is this that I see coming from Edom, from Edom? And the person that's riding the horse calls back. He said, I, 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 I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Who is this? Who is this? This is Jesus. Go on to the next verse. It says, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who has tread out the winepress? Who does that sound like? Jesus. And then he replies, I have trod in the winepress alone for the people, uh, for, from the people's, oh, I'm sorry, from the people's, no one was with me for I have trodden them in mine anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. When we arrive at the battle of Armageddon that takes place in the valley of Megiddo in the book of Revelation chapter 19, the Bible says that he's already come and his garments are stained. Where is he coming from? I believe Isaiah 63 tells us he comes from Edom. He's already had a little battle going on over there. What's happening in Edom? For Bible students who have studied the tribulation period, we see that in Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says that Israel runs into the desert and is protected by God for three and a half years. What desert do you think they run to? I believe it's Edom, Edom. 
say, why do you say this? Even Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 talks about the great tribulation period. And he says specifically, when, the ba- when, he, when you see the abomination of desolation, Israel, I want you to get up and run into the desert and flee and I will protect you. When you compare Jesus' words and you compare the words of Revelation chapter 12 and you compare Isaiah chapter 63, it seems that once Israel witnesses the abomination of desolation we spoke of two weeks ago, they get up, they head out of the city, they go down the va- into the valley near the Dead Sea. They cross over the Dead Sea and they arrive in the land of Jordan or ancient Edom. And there in the midst of the deserts, they survive and thrive for three and a half years, waiting, waiting, waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Divinely provided for. This is why some biblical theologians would say, well, where specifically in this land of Edom in the desert would they live and survive? Some point specifically to what we know as Petra. This is uh, not where Indiana Jones was. How many of you know that movie, Indiana Jones, Last Crusade? This is actually where they filmed that. Petra, it's an actual location there in Jordan. Many biblical theologians, among them, I'm just a pastor, but among them myself, believe that this is where the battle of Armageddon begins. Jesus Christ comes. This area is not only surrounded in the valley of Megiddo with the armies of the world ready to fight Jesus, but they've sent units and forces to finally rid out the rest of the Israeli, the rest of the Jews, the rest of the Christians hiding in Petra, and they are surrounded. And what does God do? He arrives according to Isaiah chapter 63 stomps them out, bloodies his garments, and says, next spot, Megiddo. And then he heads over. That leads us to the second battle I see in the, valley of, in the battle of Armageddon, and that is the defeat of the world's armies in Megiddo. This is spoken of not only in Revelation 19, but in Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16, verses 14 through 16, it says, Go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world and gather them to the great battle of the day of our God, of Almighty God, the place which is called in the Hebrew, Armageddon. This is the main battle. This is where most of the fighting will be taking place. This is the valley itself. A picture of it, if you can see it. The far right corner on the bottom right, you see the, uh, Mount, uh, the Carmel Mountains. Mount Carmel. Anybody remember what happened on Mount Carmel? This is where Elijah was, right? Elijah called down fire from heaven and consumed uh, the offering. He fought against the prophets of Baal, very high mountain there. And it overlooks the Jezreel Valley or the Valley of Megiddo. It's a huge, giant valley in Israel. Still there to this day. You can visit and tour it. It's amazing. This is where all the, va- all the armies of the world will meet their demise. The Bible says at the end of the battle when the birds are coming to eat all the people, the Bible says that the blood of the armies will be so deep it'll rise up to the bridle of the horses. Imagine a valley that large filled with that much blood. Do you understand? The wars we've seen, the battles we've seen are nothing. We are as humans fighting each other, as disgraceful as that is, is nothing in comparison to humans fighting against God. The third battle. The third battle takes place around the city of Jerusalem itself. I believe this is the final aspect of the battle of Armageddon. And that is the halt of the advanced guard that besieges Jerusalem. This is spoken of many times throughout the Minor Prophets and the Major Prophets. They talk about at the very final battle that the world's forces will then converge or the remainder will converge upon Israel to finally see its destruction. Simply repeating the type of battles we've seen over and over and over surrounding the city of Jerusalem, God's holy city, the capital of Israel, according to the Bible. The halt of the advance guard besieging Jerusalem. This is found in, among several other passages, Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah describes that day. He says, in that day I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all nations of the earth that are gathered against it. A very heavy stone. What is that? That's like, um, how many of you know what a kettlebell is? How many of you know what a kettlebell is? The devil created these. Did you know that? (laughs) No. Have you ever? Yeah. That's Satan. He did that. I'm kidding. All right. They're terrible. If you've never exercised with the kettlebell, don't. It'll kill you. All right? 
kettlebells. And that, that's a heavy stone. Imagine that. Uh, imagine going up to a kettlebell you could barely lift, a 100-pound kettlebell, and trying to, and how terrible that might be. Okay, the Bible says Israel has become that for the nations, a very heavy stone that the surrounding nations hate. Aren't they already that way? By the way, I'm thankful that America is a friend of, of Israel. God's people there. In that day, I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all nations of the earth are gathered against it in that day, says the Lord. I will strike every horse. This is what happens in that battle. The Bible says all these nations will be coming against Jerusalem in the final and I will strike every horse with confusion and its riders with madness. That is God begins to fight with Israel. And these people trying to fight against Israel, God fights off. It goes on. Look what it says. It goes on and it says, and in that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who fe is feeble among them will in that day be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. To me, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of the battle of Armageddon. God does most, Jesus does most of the fighting all throughout this. But I see indicated here, I don't know, don't hold me to it. It's an idea. I see indicated here that God actually allows the Jews that live in Israel to physically rise up and defend in the final battle their own city. The Bible says even the weak, feeble among them becomes like David himself who kills giants. And when you combine all of the house of David together, that is all of Israel together, they become like the power of God against the bad guys. Whoa. That's a battle I'd like to see, not in person, on a big screen, <laughs> popcorn, movie format. Let's be very clear. The Bible goes on. You can read more about this. We don't have time to discuss every aspect of that, but the Bible goes on. It says, in that day, they shall seek to destroy the nations that come against Israel, but God will destroy them. Zechariah 14 says, and in that day, the feet, oh, this is so cool. The Bible says in the next, in the next two chapters, in that day, his feet, Jesus' feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which faces, I, notice this, even when he's in Edom, he never steps down. And even at the Battle of Armageddon, he's just flying through. But when he finally arrives at Jerusalem, he steps down on the Mount of Olives, the same Garden of Gethsemane area that Jesus spent so much time praying. The Bible says, which faces Jerusalem to the east and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west, make it a very large valley. The moment he steps down, it splits the city. And a valley takes place all the way through. We studied this on Sunday nights when we went through the book of Joel. It says in the book of Joel that a river will sprout out of the Mount of Olives and it will head in two directions, one all the way to the Mediterranean, the other one all the way to the Dead Sea. And the city of Jerusalem will then be declared the eternal capital of the people of God. Wow. That's the battle itself. Thus far we've seen the return of Jesus, the three battles and lastly, we see the millennial kingdom of Christ. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Christians have said this for years, mimicking the prayer of Jesus. When you pray, say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Say, thy kingdom come, Christian. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. His kingdom is coming. This is the moment Jesus establishes his kingdom. If you've ever prayed the Lord's Prayer, you were praying for this moment. Thy kingdom come, waiting forever, waiting forever. Is that not what it feels like? How many of you as Christian, you've been studying this stuff for a while, and you say sometimes, man, I feel like I've been waiting forever for Jesus' kingdom. You just wait and wait and wait. I remember when, like I said, Heather and I were first dating, and I did not, I did not, I did not talk about marriage right away. I waited like three weeks. <laughs> you you got to understand, no, see, what you got to understand is this. Like she was, you know, and I was, and I was like, I got to lock this down. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, I remember when we, we did get engaged, um, it was like just waiting, you know. When are we finally going to get to the day? June 2nd, 2001, that would be our wedding date. And we, we knew that day over a year before it happened. Every day, I had a countdown in my mind. 312 days left, you know. 290 days left. 99 days left. Terrible, terrible. You know that feeling? 
Find, by the way, all of that anticipation when we saw in that church and I looked down and I saw that bride coming down the aisle, man, it was all worth it. When I, when I saw this moment, th see this, this made every hour and every day and every month that I waited for, it made it all seem like a, like a dream. Amen. Look at me, Christian. The Bible says when Jesus comes for his bride, the church, all of this waiting, all of this thousands of years of guys like me talking to people like you, talking about the book that we're studying, all of these years saying it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it'll seem like a mere dream and it'll be over because his kingdom will have come. You know the first thing he does once the battle is over? The first thing he does is he judges his enemies. Gen uh, Revelation chapter 2 or 20 verses 1 and 3, it talks about him dealing with his enemies. I, I love this part because the Bible says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a, great, a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. This is how the battle of Armageddon ends and the kingdom begins. John says, I saw another angel, he's coming. And this was an angel, very interesting. He's got a chain in his hand. Can you picture this angel swinging this chain? Who do you think he's coming for? Satan himself. You see, the Bible says, according to Revelation 13, that Satan himself has indwelt the Antichrist. The Antichrist himself has already been taken care of. His old body's been thrown into the fiery pit. And now Satan himself, that old serpent, that old devil... That old dragon that's been fighting against God and against God's people for these thousands of years, it's time for him to pay his dues. So here comes an angel with a chain. And the Bible says, and I saw the angel coming from the heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a chain in his hand. Look at verse 2 and 3. And it says he laid hold of that dragon, that old serpent, that old who, had, who the devil, the Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. So the Bible tells us he takes him, he binds him, he throws him in the bottomless pit. Look at the next verse. And the Bible says in the next verse, is that the last verse? All right. So the Bible says he gets thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Now, why a thousand years? Because this establishes a 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He is there held captive, the devil is. And at the very end of the millennium, God allows the devil out for one last hurrah to convince all of those who choose not to follow God at one more battle against God himself. There's so much that the Bible says about the millennium that I cannot take time to discuss I, every week I tell you there's going to be extra content for the small groups. I, I do these videos. We talk more about it. I will be teaching at small groups, if you're not part of one, join one, about the millennium and about fascinating truths about the millennium. You need to be at small group to discuss that. But I will tell you this about the millennial kingdom. The Bible tells us this little bit of information. If you want to study it more, Isaiah chapter 65 and 66, Zechariah chapter 14. But look what it says in Isaiah 65. It says, this is just what the millennium will be like. An example. When Satan is bound and the world is placed under the headship of Christ, the wolf and the, lion, the lamb will feed together. You imagine that? There's a lamb out there chewing grass and there's a wolf coming. And instead of the wolf chewing the lamb, <laughs> the wolf begins to chew the grass. Look what it says. It says, the, the, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. That means lions will no longer eat meat. How many of you are already thinking, I'm going to get a lion as a pet? <laughs> it's about time. Before, kind of dangerous. It eats your face, you know. Now they don't. The whole idea of the millennium is that God reverses the world back to what it was like during the Garden of Eden. Instead of just Adam and Eve being there, now we're there. And God says, the world is yours, and I'm the king. Do you want, if you're new to Christianity, do you understand why we for years have been praying, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come? The reason is, is because we know his kingdom's a lot better than ours. Amen. It's going to be amazing. How terrible it'd be to miss it. What, 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 what keeps you from coming to Christ today? 
If you haven't been saved, friend, why rebel against him? Delusional? Delusional is the person who lives 60, 70 years, looks around this world, thinks himself to be created by nothing, dies and faces his creator. That's delusional. When you've been told the truth and you can repent and receive Christ today. Delusional? Delusional is the Christian who willingly gives his soul to God for salvation, but fights the same God on every little thing he wants you to do. God says, stop this. And you say, I'll do what I want. God says, do this. I don't want to follow you. Delusional. How do you fight against? Look, human, I'm with you on this. How do you fight against the God who created you? You going to win? Josh, have you ever been delusional? Yeah. Have you ever fought against God himself? Oh, yes. Because I'm stupid. There have been many times as pastor of this church, I have felt very clearly God saying, do this. Oh, God, if I were to do that, you know, boy, I don't know. That could really cause some problems in our church. I'm not sure if I should. We fight against God as if we could win. Are you fighting against God today, Christian? Why don't you just give in and say, God, whatever you want, because you're going to win in the end anyway. Yes. How about if you're not a Christian today, you give in and say, Lord Jesus, I know you died for me. I don't want to die and go to hell. Save my soul before it's too late. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. I'm so thankful that you promised so many years ago to come again, to receive us unto yourself, that where you are, we may be also. And my prayer today is that we would long for that moment and live and the reality of it every day. Bless my friends today as we have studied your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Heads bowed. And I if God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world. 